So, is there by any chance something you're struggling to decide right now? I don't know. Maybe what to eat tonight or which courses to choose. Maybe you have to decide whether you change jobs or end a relationship. Maybe something even more significant, whether to get married, have a child, or join a risky protest. Now, in all these cases, if they apply to you, good for you. And I'm not saying this out of compassion, of empathy, because I know that hesitation can be very uncomfortable, even distressing. No, I'm saying this because actually being undecided is quite an extraordinary power of your mind. And it's a power we neglect for our own misery. So what I really want to share with you today is why we should value our indecision and not always try to fight it. To do so, I wanted to start with a personal story and how it all started. And that actually started when I moved to Munich and I picked up running. Now, inevitably, my knee started to hurt. So much so that I had to go and see a doctor and she kindly said, well, you have two options. You can be operated or you can stop running. In either case, no guaranteed result. So I left her office and I was really in two minds. And I shared this dilemma with some friends on the chat. And this is the answers I immediately received from them. Just do it, said the first. Well, you know what? Any decision is better than no decision, said the second. Now, at this stage, I started to be a bit puzzled by the pattern. And I don't know about you, but I can certainly think about some times in my life when no decision would have been better than the decision I took. <laughs> But the final strike really came with the third friend who said kindly, remember Jeff Bezos' rule? Make a decision with only 70% of the information you wish to have. This really clicked with the philosopher in me. So I responded, you mean make no decision until I have 70% of the information I wish I have. This teasing exchange with my friends really left me thinking. Why is it that Jeff Bezos' version sounded so sexy and brave, and my version sounded so defensive and negative? And I started to realize actually more and more how we had become all decision fetishists. Right? It's not just my friends with their encouraging advice. It's actually the titles that we see in the bookshops. How to be decisive. Decide now or die trying. <laughs> it's also in the politicians' mouths when they come in front of us and say they already know how to fix everything. It's eventually in the journalists' mouths when they criticize, for instance, Angela Merkel for lacking leadership and not being decisive enough. But really, for me, it resonated because even more so in research, we've always focused on decisions. Economists study decisions, how we invest, how we save money. Psychologists focus on decisions when we decide to quit smoking or start a diet. And we ourselves, cognitive scientists, we focus on decisions, though of a minor kind. When you lift a finger, it's a decision. If you look at this wall and decide it's gray, then that's another decision. If you click on your phone, that's a decision. So 
couldn't we start looking at indecision also a bit more positively? I came back and I shared my doubts with the lab. And together, we ironically started to refer to ourselves as a new group, the indecision-making lab. Now, that really made us see our experiments differently, and that's what I want to share with you now. In what you will see in the typical experiments that we conduct, we try and show how people gather information and fin finally select a given option. So, for instance, you see some dots, and let's say, to go back to the operation case, that if the dots go on the left, it means that you find good information in favor of the knee operation. But if the dots go on the right, it means that you find a lot of reasons not to go for this operation. Now, let me give you the first example, right? Pretty clear, dots go on the left, good evidence, go for the operation. Take another case. This time, the dots go on the right. Maybe not such a good idea to go for the operation. That's how we usually study and model decisions. And there, indecision is just the temporary state you have to go through so that you can make a choice. The thing is, the world is not really like this. It's much more like this, right? It's what we call noisy. You don't really get a clear signal. It's also possible that the word is ambiguous. That is, some people see more dots going left and some people see more dots going right. And even more so, the words, maybe more now, have started to be like this goes in one direction and then changes and then changes again in a state we call volatility. Now, if the word is noisy, ambiguous, or volatile, ask yourself, is it a right idea to call it a right or a left? Or is it not now more appropriate to suspend your judgment? Now, indecision is no longer the thing you have to overcome. What you have to overcome is the urge to decide. And this urge to decide is actually what distinguishes us as humans quite straightforwardly from other species. If you think of dogs or pigeons, flies, zebrafish, this kind of animals we study, we know quite well that they are driven by what we call stimulus response. It's almost impossible or really difficult for them not to act on the basis of even minimal information. By contrast, we have this capacity to disengage and reflect and hesitate. Now, this is quite interesting because instead of picturing us humans as being special because we make smarter or more complex decisions than other animals, we start to realize that maybe what makes us start smart is our capacity to be undecided. Now, where does this special capacity rest? Well, to show you some pictures of the brain, we can also see here on the left, illuminated in orange, the kind of activity that is taking place when you have to gather evidence to make a judgment. But what you see on the right, these other areas which are mostly located in what we call the prefrontal cortex, which is the top of the brain that rests under your forehead, then these areas are specially devoted to reflecting and telling you whether you should make a decision or not. Now, a lot of research is going on to understand better what's going on in these areas, but we already know quite a lot of fascinating things. For instance, we know that infants as young as 20 months old 
already have sufficient brain power to think it twice before doing something by themselves and turn to an adult because they don't think they can decide on their own. We also know that the same areas of the brain that are involved in processing indecision is probably, are probably dysfunctioning in patients with obsessive compulsive disorders or severe depression and explain why they can't decide that they have really, say, closed the door or can't decide to get out of bed. Now, clearly these are cases where indecision go wrong. But I think I've convinced you that also indecision can be justified and appropriate. So now the question is when, right? When are we optimally undecided? Well, there, the cognitive scientist has to defer back to the philosopher. And as a philosopher, I'm sorry, but I will not offer you a Jeff Bezos rule. <laughs> what I can do is just to tell you to maybe reconsider a few things. Take, for instance, career indecision. It's the fact that many people, especially younger generations, have a hard time committing to a special job. Instead, they tend to change positions or go from one project to another. Now, if you ask parents, managers, educators, this is always pictured as a deficit. A deficit of drive, a deficit of passion, a deficit of willpower. But remember the dots now. And ask yourself, what type of information the younger generations are getting about the job market? It can be very ambiguous with advice giving in many different directions. It can be also very volatile with things changing sometimes very fast and then reversing again. And if that's the case, career indecision is no longer a deficit. It's actually a smart adaptation. A second thing I thought about talking about was indecision in romantic matters. But then I realized it's too controversial, so I switched to a different topic. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about politics instead, much less controversial, right? <laughs> uh, undecided voters. Also something which, interestingly, is on the rise. And maybe you know that undecided voters were really the one calling on the election in 2016 in the United States. Now this time, these undecided voters are represented as lacking strong political preferences. But put yourself in the shoes of an elector and wonder what they get from social media journalists or even politicians. And go back again to the dots. There is certainly a lot of noise in the information we get. There is a lot of ambiguity and sometimes volatility. Therefore, instead of thinking about undecided voters exclusively under the prism as lacking preferences, maybe they have preferences. They just don't have enough information to know who will defend them properly. So, where does this leave us as a final piece of advice? Well, hopefully, now you know, don't blame young people for their career in decision. Don't always blame the voters for not knowing who they will cast their ballot for. And most importantly, perhaps, be a bit kinder to yourself next time you find yourself hesitating. Because really, a world where we have more indecision and we accept it as smart and adaptive is maybe a word where we stop falling only for those who try always to impress us with their decisiveness. So thank you.